the both equity and inequity, I think, is is everywhere. I think there are examples of both. When I think about you know equity is a is a broad term, so you could you can interpret that in many different ways. And you know when you start talking about equity, people often ask, "What's your definition of equity?" So I think if if we're talking about equity as access to both access to learning and and having all the supports necessary. Well, and, and I think that uh, when when you look at equity and and striving for equity in, in a school system, it, it's increasingly important that we work across our entire community to to reach to reach that as opposed to just working in isolation within a school district. So it's you know, in looking at, I was talking about wellness before and, and student wellness, if we're not really closely aligned with all of our different community partners, they're all doing that same kind of work, but they're looking at a different aspect of, of what that wellness is. And so if we're all aligned and working together and pooling limited resources and, and, and understanding what the issue is, then I think we're we're more able to to provide what students need. I think for some, perhaps many families who don't struggle economically, the exception can be that there isn't economic struggle in Vermont, or that it's not as significant an issue as I think what it really is. Um, and I think it is a significant issue in Vermont. So again, I don't know that it's misunderstood, but there's a difference in perception, right? If it's not part of your daily observation or your daily circle, it can be hard to comprehend the struggle that exists, um, even when we think about within a single classroom, right? So children from homes that are not economically disadvantaged might be sitting right next to someone who is significantly economically disadvantaged in their home and have no idea, which can create the perception that there isn't that problem. Um, and therefore perhaps impacts our, our motivation to address the problem. So again, I don't think it's a necessarily misunderstanding, but, but potential for increased awareness, I guess. So I grew up in a small town Town that um, I often compare to Virgins. Um, and it was in upstate New York, um, near Ithaca, New York. And I, for a lot of my childhood, or for a big part of my childhood, lived on a little farm. And it was really far from school. And so I had a 45 minute bus ride, which is what a lot of people are worried about <laughs> for their kids. And um, we had a lot of animals and I had to get up every morning and help my brother take care of the animals before school. And we didn't have the enough money for me to have two pairs of boots. And we moved to this farm when I was in sixth grade. So, and we moved to a new school district. So it was a new school district. It was the first time I'd gone there and I had to go to school with boots that smelled like my barn. And a lot of kids picked on me. And um, we also didn't have enough money to pay for school lunch, but my dad was too proud to let us um, get free school lunch. So we often came to school with not very much food in our lunch bags. And I smelled like a barn and a lot of kids teased me and I was the new kid. And it was really, really hard um, because I didn't know a lot of kids. I didn't understand how the school worked. They thought I was weird and smelled and didn't have enough food. And it was really, really, really hard. Um, so I think it's hard to be the new kid always, no matter where you're going. And it's especially hard to be the new kid who doesn't have the resources to be able to dress the same as the other kids or eat the same as the other kids. So I often think about that and how hard it was and how alienating it was. And even though I was a really good student and I was really smart, it didn't seem to matter because I didn't have good boots from from the way kids are perceived and how they dress um, you know and that there's within kids a dress code it's not the schools it's the kids right that if you have certain things then you know you're cooler than if you don't um, and kids know that um, so you know down to the water bottle you use right so I think that that's 
a situation where separation happens instantly. At the state believe that that's at least in large part due to the high cost of living in Vermont. The result of that aging population means we have fewer adults in our workforce, and it also means we have fewer students in our education system as a state. In an attempt to try and help control the high cost of living in Vermont, there are spending thresholds or spending limits that have been set by the state for spending per pupil. So in districts like ours that are losing students and are seeing costs increase in terms of, you know, employee costs and building costs and, and all costs associated with providing education, that combination of increasing costs and decreasing students is putting a lot of communities like ours in Addison County in a position where they basically have to choose two of three options, can have any two, but you can't have all three. And the three options really are either choose to spend over the spending threshold and pay the penalties that come along with exceeding that spending limit, which could pretty significantly increase taxes. Or we could choose to operate fewer schools in an effort to save the dollars that need to be saved and continue to provide the kind of support and services that we wanna to provide to our students to help bridge this achievement gap that we've been talking about and, and really help all students achieve. Or we could choose to keep taxes reasonable, keep all of our schools open and reduce the support and services that we offer our students. Those, it's sort of this three-legged stool scenario where we can pick any two of those three legs. We just don't get to have all three. And that's a really, really challenging position for local leaders and our local communities to be in to have to figure that out and make those hard decisions. And yet the reality is as a state, not all school districts are in that same situation. And even for the many districts that are in that same situation, they may make different decisions about how to move forward. Sometimes we think that equity means that every school has the same opportunities, right? And so we are looking at equity as everybody gets the same. And because of the lack of resources, sometimes that means that a school that has had something has to lose it in order to be able to create that equity for someone else. I don't know necessarily that it's much of uh, trying to change a misconception. Uh, I think really what it is uh, that I, from my perspective is perspectives, is understanding and recognizing our own selves and having more of an um, understanding of where we're coming from and how our bias impact the way that we're seeing things. As, as a young person, in my circumstances, raised by a single mother who was physically disabled, paraplegic, in and out of the hospital, um, supported by various adults throughout um, my youth, and really the systems that education and athletics and the structure and the support and the community that that gave me really sustained me and many of my siblings uh, over the course of my life. And so as I went through college and saw the end of my time in education uh, and, and still feeling so influenced by educators and people in my community uh, and coaches, I didn't want to leave that system. Um, and we grew up really poor, um, you know, definitely struggled to make ends meet uh, despite my mom working really hard. Uh, I'm one of seven kids that she had, um, quite, a, quite a range in ages. Uh, so when I was, when my parents divorced, I was five. My next oldest brother would have been about 13. Uh, so that would have been a 13 year old, then a 15 year old, 17 year old, 18 year old. So getting older there, but I also have a younger brother who when my parents split up would have been probably about four. So, you know, growing up with economic struggle, which as a kid, I never really knew the difference because I only knew what I knew. But in looking back, I recognized the, the struggle that we had. And I'm, I'm really fortunate and very thankful um, for the supports that I received from my education that gave me opportunities to 
pursue my interests and my passions. Um, and we definitely received help from our community, from our school system um, to help us overcome some of the challenges that we faced as a family. So I've, I'm uh, an example of the kinds of support and the difference that that level of support can make in changing someone's life trajectory. My main feeling, just kind of seeing what happens, not just in, in ACSD, but across the world and looking at education is, I think we need to think more holistically about education and education can't be as this greater good and as this equalizer that you mentioned earlier, can't do everything on its own. You know, we, we see students seven hours a day and 175 days a year. How do we continue to address these inequalities? How do we continue to provide food and housing and health care to everybody after the crisis is over? And that will be the real test for our schools and for our state and our country. Um, because Vermont has done so well, lots of people are looking at what we're doing, but can we keep doing it? And will we keep doing it when there's not a crisis? And I hope that we will. And I hope that um, I will do everything. I know I will do everything I can to, to make sure that we continue to address all of the, these problems. Um, but I think that's the real test is not, not during the crisis, but after the crisis, how does the country and the state and the community and the school respond? Mm -hmm.